I wonder. I think it's possible. A flying car. I could design an air car and make millions. Great. But how would the wings be made? And they'd have to be light and strong, not metal. Maybe plastic. How would they be attached? I guess I need to know how cars are built. Then I could figure out how to add wings. And I'd need a propulsion device, like a propeller or a jet engine, to move it through the air. Computer on. Yes, Mike. What can I do for you? Computer, I want to know about the way things are made, the processes. Got another presentation to make in class, Mike? No. Well, yes, next week. But right now I've got a great idea, a flying car. So I need to know about how things are made, things like cars and planes. I'm pretty familiar with how the manufacturing system works and the kinds of materials used, but I don't have any idea how things are actually made into particular shapes and then put together. It's the final thing I need to know for my presentation. Three seconds, please, Mike. Okay, ready. Manufacturing processes, as you requested. Primary processing, which you learned about previously, changes raw materials like wood and metal into standard stock. The standard stock then requires further processing to be made into finished products. This further processing is called secondary processing and is what you're asking about. There are six kinds of secondary processes used by manufacturing. These are casting and molding, forming, separating, conditioning, assembling, and finishing. Each of these processes changes the original standard stock material step by step into a new form, whether it's a usable manufactured part or a product. Casting and molding are similar processes in which a material in a liquid or non-solid state is poured or forced into a prepared mold. Both processes depend on either an expendable or a reusable mold. First, the material is prepared by softening, dissolving, or mixing it with other materials. Then, once the material is poured or forced into the mold, it's solidified by cooling, drying, or a chemical reaction. The new solid part or product is then removed by destroying the mold, if it's expendable, or by opening the mold, if it's to be reused. When this process is done with metal or ceramic, it's referred to as casting. But when it's done with plastic, it's called molding. Both casting and molding are the only processes that can directly change industrial materials into a finished part in one step. The next process, forming, changes the size and shape of the material, but not the volume of the material. In forming, a force is applied to the material, which is strong enough to change its shape, but not so strong that it destroys the material itself. Great mechanical force high air pressure, explosives, or a strong vacuum are used to force the material through or against the die or mold. All of these tools must be harder and stronger than the material they form. Some materials are formed at room temperature. Others are heated to make the forming process easier or to produce a more accurate part. Forming may require several steps with each change in the shape of the original material being made one step at a time. Glass bottles, on the other hand, are formed from molten material in a single step. The next manufacturing process is separating. Separating changes materials in size and shape. 
there are two traditional separating methods, machining and shearing. Machining changes the shape and size of materials by removing chips or particles a little bit at a time. Shearing changes the shape and size of materials by fracturing or breaking off pieces. In both of these instances, a tool or cutting element is used. More recently, other separating methods have been developed. These include non-traditional machining and flame cutting. In non-traditional machining, chemicals, electrical sparks, heat, and light, like lasers, are used to separate particles or pieces from the original material. In flame cutting, a high temperature torch with a special tip is used to separate the excess material. Heat is also used to cut plastic material, but instead of a flame, a hot wire or similar device is used. The most recently developed separating process technology uses chemical action, etching, in the fabrication of electronic components. So far, we've talked about the first kind of secondary processing of materials, that is, changing size and shape. The next kind is conditioning. Conditioning is used to change the internal properties of materials, such as making them stronger, harder, tougher, and more or less elastic. The reasons for conditioning include improving material machining and forming characteristics removing internal stress, and giving the material special properties. One example of a material that is heat conditioned is raw rubber. Using a process called vulcanization or heat curing, raw rubber is made both strong and flexible for products like tires and boots. Clay can also be heat conditioned by firing it to make bricks and pottery. The other conditioning methods are chemical and mechanical. Chemical conditioning is used to harden plaster, concrete, and plastics, as well as to treat natural substances to change their properties, like treating animal hides to become leather. Mechanical conditioning is used to change the internal structure of materials by compression, pounding, or squeezing. When metal is mechanically conditioned, its microscopic, soft, round grain structure is changed into long, flat, hard grains in order to make it stronger. The third kind of manufacturing process is assembly, where all the parts of a product are put together. Three basic methods of assembly are used in manufacturing. Bonding, mechanical fastening, and joining. Assembly by bonding is used with metals, plastics, wood, and ceramics. One method of bonding uses heat, such as welding or melting two pieces together at the attachment point. Another bonding method uses very high pressure on soft materials. Solvent bonding softens materials, like plastic, so they can be pressed together permanently. Another bonding process uses adhesives to glue two parts together. Mechanical fastening uses fasteners like screws, nuts and bolts, and rivets to hold different pieces together. Force is also used, such as pressing one piece into another or folding two pieces together this method depends on friction to keep these pieces together permanently. Joining is an assembly method that uses naturally fitting shapes, such as dovetail cut wood joints, the folded joining of sheet metal ductwork, or zip closures and Velcro type fasteners. Most products require a surface finish, which provides protection and makes them more attractive. This final process is called finishing. One type of finishing involves coating over the surface of a material. The other is a conversion of the surface itself. Often, a coating, such as paint, is sprayed in the material, 
In other cases, the material itself is dipped into a tank of coating, then allowed to dry. Metal and ceramic coatings are applied in a variety of ways for a variety of uses, including the chrome on car trim, the zinc coating used on metal to prevent rusting, and the glaze found on plumbing fixtures. The second type of finishing, conversion, changes the surface of materials by chemical action. However, no coating is applied. Instead, the surface molecules are altered to make a protective or decorative layer around the material being converted. Finishing makes products both more attractive and durable. That's it, Mike. Do you have enough information now? Um, yes, that's enough. Really more than I needed. Oh, it's not as simple as I thought. I'm not sure I understand. What's your request? Oh, I was just talking to myself. Now I know about the manufacturing processes, but it's not enough. I know that there's casting and molding, forming, separating, uh, conditioning, assembling, and finishing. But I also need to know something about choosing the manufacturing materials themselves. How does a manufacturer choose materials and decide what materials are best for different uses? Just a moment. Okay, what you're asking about, Mike, is called the properties of materials. Understanding the properties of materials gives the designers the knowledge they need to design a product that works as intended. Material properties are categorized as mechanical, physical, thermal, chemical, electrical, optical, and acoustical. While mechanical properties have to do with the ability of a material to withstand or support force, physical properties are the size, density, and surface texture of a material. And thermal properties refer to a material's ability to withstand heat or cold effectively. Chemical properties are a material's ability to withstand chemical attack, such as corrosion, Electrical properties identify a material's conductivity or resistance to electrical current. Optical properties relate to a material's ability to pass, refract, or prevent the passage of light. And acoustical properties refer to the sound transference or absorption of a material. Manufacturers devote much time to the examination and classification of material properties. In addition, Manufacturers operate research and development departments to discover or create materials with special desired properties. How's that, Mike? <sighs> That's good computer. But it doesn't tell me what materials I need to build a flying car. Give me a minute to access a bigger computer and I'll list materials with their properties. There are over 70,000, so it'll take a while. Accessing. Whoa, computer. Stop. I'll find out some other time. That'd be a bit much right now. Well, before you try to find all the necessary materials for your flying car, you first might want to concentrate on how to design it. That space shuttle you're holding was made to be more aerodynamic using some of the same technology used for designing regular airplanes. In a similar way, you'll probably want to study how space shuttles are made in order to make your flying car. Hmm. Good point. But first, I guess I better get ready for my class presentation next week. Uh, thanks, computer. You can shut down now.